do uh, aim it at Laura or Virginia who will do their very best to help you. And can I also thank many of you who sent some really insightful questions that I'm going to put to Nicole. And if you have any questions or comments, if you could put them in the uh, the chat in the chat bar, then we can take those toes forward. So, so once again, just thank Nicole and thank all of you who've uh, given up time in your busy diaries. Um, Many of you who I've worked with, it's been like in a, an enormous room of friends, to be honest, uh, have worked with me during my time as police and crime commissioner. And you know that right from the very start that I was I wanted to be a very fierce advocate for victims and families, especially domestic abuse survivors. We all know the shocking statistics and we know how complex this crime is. We know it, it doesn't just affect one family, that it affects families, uh, one family, it affects, affects children. And even, you know, as a, a, an ex-family uh, magistrate, I was always very conscious of the impact that this had. And it's a real concern to everyone. Most of you know that I'm not standing as Police and Crime Commissioner in May, but I want to leave this role knowing that you, as, as su support for, for victims, are well supported. And, and, and hence the reason of asking Nicole to join us so that you understand what her role is and know that you can contact contact her. So we're going to start by me asking a few questions, Nicole, and then I've got a number of questions that have been put forward by our local our local partners. Um, so can you tell us more about the role of, of, of the Domestic Abuse Commissioner? Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see everyone and I have to say I just want to I just spotted Anna Smith, who um, I used to work with, who's who's joined. It's so nice to see you, Anna. And I know that there's a few organizations um, that I'm familiar with. So there may be more um, in those turned off cameras of people that I should be saying a special hello to. Um, for those of you who've not um, heard much about this role, I'll, I'll just say the obvious kind of key point. So I was I was appointed um, as a designate a little over a year ago. And so the, the position of the domestic abuse commissioner sits in the domestic abuse bill, which is now kind of nearing the uh, report stage at law in the House of Lords. Um, so we're getting to the final stages and I'm, I'm sure we'll come to that. And sitting in the bill has um, more um, statutory underpinning for the office of the domestic abuse commissioner. So I use the term designate now. So when the bill passes, I'll drop that um, term as designate and carry on in the position. And I'm really glad that um, government decided to appoint it kind of ahead of the bill, um, partly because I've realized over the course of the last year um, how long it takes uh, when you're an arm's length body <laughs> of government, I've worked in the charity sector most of my career. Um, and when you want to hire, there's a lot of restrictions and a lot of frustrations there. But if you want to hire and kind of get things up and running, um, I, I've realized now it's taken a lot less time than it is if you, you're doing things in the way that is required by the Home Office. So, so the, my office is an arm's length body of government, which essentially means that funding for the office is through government. Um, and so, of course, very rightfully, I have to use a lot of the same um, kind of back office functions as the civil service. So that's in terms of recruitment and setting up websites and all of the, those kinds of things. But in terms of um, independence, it's very important. And I've really embraced um, the idea that obviously I'm independent of government or my offices and that we are there to both advise and hold government to account. So um, very particularly, some of the things that we are set out to do is um, map services and that's not all of what we do but as a kind of fundamental first step is kind of the mapping of services to really get a sense of um, what provision of services out there um, in England and in Wales so um, the remit of our office is the whole of England obviously and then anything that's not devolved to Welsh government so um, mainly justice issues in relation to Wales but obviously very interested um, in the provision of, of commission services um, for domestic abuse and and 
because there's such a huge overlap to wider issues of sexual violence, so-called honor-based violence, forced marriage, um, you know, some of the wider, you know, stalking and harassment, um, those kinds of things. There's, there is um, that, it's not a, I'm not a Violence Against Women and Girls Commissioner, but in terms of the remit and the scope of what we do, I would say it's fairly um, overlapping into those areas. And that Vera Baird, who's the, the Victims Commissioner, and I try to share as much of that remit and be as proactive together on some of those issues as we possibly can. So a lot of our um, initial work is in relation to mapping of services, but obviously throughout the last year, there's been a huge amount of um, keeping up with and advising government and really staying as active as, I, as we possibly can with getting up and running, but also advising um, and being uh, as proactive with government as possible during COVID and in the later stages of the bill. So the bill has been a long standing, uh, very long running bill. And we're now finally um, with the bill back in kind of committee stage and report stages. We're now in the, the last few months of the, the domestic abuse bill. So I hope that gives you a sense of, of my office. I just, sometimes I like to say this just because it, it, well, it'll hopefully seem most pretty obvious, but I don't actually, even though I have the term commissioner, I don't commission out services myself or our office doesn't. It's very much a kind of, our team breaks down into some, some communications um, functions, but also a policy team, a small research team, and a practice and partnerships team. So we'll be locating and have hired, in fact, they just started this week, people who sit in various um, geographic locations who will help um, to really open kind of more communication beyond uh, beyond London. Because one of the things that I've, re I've really appreciated is that, of course, most of the practice and implementation and most of the commissioning is happening at a more local level and the strategic conversations are happening at the more local level. And so it's really important that my office is developing um, relationships and, and actually has people whose job it is to really help kind of the two way communication between um, different geographical areas in my office. Thank you. And that's that strategic local is really key, isn't it? So I really support the, the mapping exercise you're trying to do, because one, that's how we're going to get more money from the Treasury, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and, and two, it is really patchy, isn't it, across, I mean, it's patchy in even Somerset, it's it's a lot patchier across across the, uh, the the country. Can you tell us a bit about your background, Nicole? What what drew you into uh, in, in this work? Well, I've, um, I've worked pretty much my entire career in this. So I studied um, politics when I was at university and I, you can tell from my accent, I'm sure that I didn't go to university here. I'm, I'm American originally. Um, and I, um, you know, I did a few really life-changing kind of placements when I was at university at a rape crisis center um, in particular. And that kind of led me towards more and more interest and, and just, you know, more and more commitment to these issues. So I was um, about 21 years old and I spent um, a few months working at a rape crisis center and going to court with um, young people who were victims of sexual abuse. And one of the things I realized um, was essentially that by and large most of the perpetrators of the that abuse were family members or known to those children so they were family members or boyfriends of their mother um or something and it, i think it kind of woke me up to the issues in relation to um sexual violence and family violence and um and then when I went back to my campus, I had kind of mo moved away to a, and came back to campus. And then suddenly a lot of my friends over the years who I'd known by that time for about four years, um, because they thought I knew something about sexual violence, then started in the late hours sometimes, you know, disclosing their own 
experiences of sexual violence and um and it really just opened my eyes and i've never really looked back i've i think it's one of those things that once you're live to the the prevalence of of violence um against women and girls and domestic abuse um you just can't really look away again you you know and i just became more and more motivated by the ideas of what do you do about it what are the interventions what are the ways you hold perpetrators to account what are the ways the systems need to change to really understand these things better and i brought that with me when i moved to london um, in the late 1990s so even though my accent is still quite strong, I think. Um, it, I have worked here most of my adult life and I'm married and have a family um, here. And so most of my work has been in um, domestic abuse, either frontline services or kind of systemic kind of change uh, initiatives and organizations um, since then. So. And, and many of the things you said, and I'm sure resonate with many of those around this virtual table, is that once you get into this piece of work, there is no, you know, it, it, it almost sucks you in uh, and there is such a great need that you probably don't leave, leave. but also, you know, you, you, you have to be passionate about this, about this work and, uh, and, and the more, you, the more you learn, the more you, you, you know, you want to um, change, change, change. Yeah. So let's move on to the Domestic Abuse Bill, which is um, set to become this landmark piece of legislation. Can you tell us a bit more about it? And, and were there any amendments that you specifically fought for? Oh, yes. It's my favourite subject lately. Um, so the Domestic Abuse Bill, I can imagine many of you do know the kind of the key provisions that are, are currently in the bill. Um, but just just to quickly rattle through the most obvious ones that it creates a statutory definition of domestic abuse for the first time. So for years and years, I've been training on this on this issue and you would I would always train to kind of what was across a, an agreed definition across government. And now we'll have on the face of the bill. Um, a definition that includes children in their own right um, as subject to domestic abuse. It includes financial abuse. Um, it includes the range of coercion and control, which is a really, you know, it just gives a nice, good, broad definition. Some people would like the definition to be more, gen you know, gendered, specifically noted as um, prevalent to most prevalent in, in female victims. Um, I, that, that's currently not in the bill, but it will be um, very much highlighted in the, a statutory guidance that runs alongside the bill. Um, I've already said the bill has provisions for my office, um, but I would have, I mean, just two things that I think are very exciting about the powers of the office. One is that it allows, um, it, it requires public um, services to cooperate, a duty to cooperate for information. So um, I think that will be, a, you know, I hope and I believe that will be a real game changer in terms of thinking about the areas of improvement that we need kind of across the board, because sometimes we lack getting at information from public bodies that would help us to make the case for, for better and more um, systemic improvements. And so the bill offers that as a power of my office. And it also offers an, and, um, and a power to make recommendations of public bodies that have to be responded to within 56 days. So again, it doesn't mean that anything that we say or recommend has to be done. It just means that there is a, a power that it has to be taken seriously and responded to um, in a timely way. So. The, those are some of the provisions in relation to my office. And we're seeking some amendments to just improve the, the breadth of public bodies because I would like to have more of an oversight mechanism within my office to see, um, to make sure that actions from homicide reviews, but also a number of other reviews and re that, re that have an element of domestic abuse um, or sexual violence in them are, um, you know, some part of my office and the role could be to make sure that those actions are being implemented. And so we have a couple of technical amendments that help to just improve the public bodies to make sure we get at the information more proactively. Um, the bill gives very, very importantly um, a, a 
statutory duty for refuge provision or accommodation based services. So you will have seen 125 million pounds was set aside in the spending review um, for that provision and areas will have recently had their allocation from MHCLG um, in relation to that, um, fulfilling that part four of the bill. So I'd be very keen to hear from people who are here whether your allocation, if you feel that it's been fair and right, and if there's any problems with that, because I know areas are really in pretty um, deep preparation now to kind of implement that part of the duty which will be in the bill because the government has made it really clear that they want that they want areas to act as if that duty is in place from April 1st um, even though the bill won't have passed until about that time which means technically it would take a few more weeks or maybe a couple of months after the first of the financial year for that duty to be um, actually in place. Uh, the bill also gives um, priority need for housing. So whether you're single or with children, um, it creates a unified order called a DAPO that you could apply for within civil court or family, I mean, criminal or civil court. Um, that will be piloted, so that won't be immediately implemented. That will be kind of carefully, I hope, piloted, and I hope to stay involved with that. Um, because it's an interesting order and in that it can create um, uh, uh, positive requirements, so things that we don't normally have now, so the, the order um, as it's laid out would be able, you could attach requirements for the perpetrator to attend behavioral change programs or um, services for substance misuse, those types of positive requirements can be attached to the DAPO. Um, and all of that needs to be really carefully worked out because um, and one of the things we're doing right now in my office is mapping services for perpetrator intervention um, because you those positive requirements are only as good as the services that are out there to and available. Um, so those are some key things. The, the bill also improves some aspects of criminal court, civil court, things like prohibiting the perpetrator from cross examining. Um, their former partner, say, in, in family court, which you may have seen having been a magistrate in family court, um, you know, special measures. So there are some things in the bill that really do kind of tighten up and improve those experiences. Having said all of that, I think we're, I'm pretty actively working on some amendments to the bill, but I'll pause for a moment because I feel like I'm kind of rattling on. Um, but we can talk about the, the further bill amendments if you'd like to do that. Thank, thank you, Nicole. In fact, we've got a question later on about perpetrator scheme, but um, but I think it, um, what you're saying is will be music to everyone's ears. Um, some of the things that this this bill, you, you you almost hold your head in shame about why it's taken so long to 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 get to, you know to 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 be enacted. So uh, the more that we can do to help you, the better. What what have you got any um, any thoughts about how we as police victim services and partners could prepare for that launch to ensure that the implementation is 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 the success that we all want yeah well you know mhclg has um did they released some capacity building funds last year last calendar year in anticipation of the the statutory duty coming into place um and i do think some oh, quite a few areas are getting um, what the what the bill requires is a tier one board so a county level board to be to be um, created to help implement the um, they don't actually they're not meant to commission out the the accommodation based services but they're meant to be looking at the kind of the needs and the capacities um, and the mapping that is needed to kind of plan for the provision um, and of course a lot of these tier one boards will be have been doing that um, and I've been hearing all over the country different ways that's happened. So sometimes the funding has been used to actually just appoint someone whose job it will be to really bring together all of the partners and really get the information together and the commissioning organized. Um, some areas have chosen to kind of outsource that mapping and needs assessment to other charities or um, you know consultants who are coming in and, and doing something similar but kind of leaving them with 
just more of kind of a range of products to get bill ready. Um, but I would say that one of the key things I would love is, you know, is to think about, um, you know, what, are, where are the strategic partnerships in, in the footprint of the PCC and in, or, and or the county and really think through kind of all elements of the bill, including the statutory guidance. Um, and that's one of the things I had been kind of slightly pushing for is to say, why don't we open up the remit of this tier one board, not to just look at the, the refuge or accommodation based services, but why, why don't they look at the range of services in the area and also the statutory guidance that's coming alongside the bill to make sure you know that there's some kind of an agreed understanding of where you're kind of doing quite well on some of these th things and some of the plans and the services that need to be in place and where areas need to improve and plan for um, and pool budgets and think of think of all of these strategic ways of working together um, to do that. So I think I think there are some things that will be out. Um, you know, some of the charities are kind of very. Um, Women's Aid, I've talked to Refuge recently, Safe Lives recently, who are starting to kind of get together what they call kind of bill ready mm -hmm. um, workshops and uh, things for people to look at. So I think, I, and I know the LGA again is holding some workshops, I know in the next couple of weeks as well. And of course, MHCLG has been conducting some, but very narrowly is MHCLG's interest in the bill is very much the part four accommodation based services and I guess my my pitch would be to kind of open up a little bit wider conversation and talk through kind of all of the elements of the bill and also the statutory guidance that sits alongside the bill. Yeah, thank you. And, and we have some colleagues from local authorities uh, around this table and who work extremely well with our with our providers. So I think that that will. Yeah, rest. I'd be so interested to hear that really and truly. I'd be interested to hear more about that. OK, so let's I've, I've taken my prerogative as, as being the, the host, being able to ask you my question. Let's move on to the questions that were raised from our victim services. So the first question is from uh, our local provider, Nextlink. So in Bristol, 50 percent of women and children who access Nextlink's domestic abuse service are BME. They tell support workers about the discrimination and struggles they face coming forward and how their isolation is compounded when reaching out for support. So in your role as DA, DA Commissioner, how will you make sure that BME victims' voices are heard and that their needs are assessed? Uh, I suppose, I mean, I, first of all, I know Next uh, Link and they're an excellent service um, and it's great to see these questions. I, I think there's no one way to do that, but I suppose I would hope that in, in day to day, I'm doing everything I can to um, really promote the need for buy and for services and, and really stress the importance of specialist independent services. And I the part of the reason I know that is of course I've worked in some of these services and I know that victims or people who are subject to domestic abuse or any range of abuses, they, they really value the independence of those services and making sure that, um, you know, there's someone who, or there is a service that is very much set up by and for them. And so what I try to do um, in my day to day right now, even in this designate stage, is to remind um, remind uh, government and also other trusts and foundations, because, of course, part of the issue here is that the patchwork of funding that currently needs to come together is actually quite complex. So just to take a step back, part of the reason why I was ever, or the, the role of the Domestic Abuse Commissioner was ever created was the acknowledgement by the government themselves that what you said earlier, um, you, Sue, about the, the, cha the differences in area to area for provision of service. So, um, and that's across the whole, the whole gamut of services. So crisis intervention, early intervention, um, preventative work, children, services for children, services for adult victims, services for um, perpetrators or people using violence to change. In every area, genuinely, the, the patchwork is, is going to look, or the provision of service will look different. And what funding is brought together in order to fund those services would be different. And so we have to 
um, create a much more kind of sustainable um, funding uh, for any of these services, which is why the, the biggest amendment to the bill that I keep, I'm working on and very actively working on right now is to expand that statutory duty um, for accommodation based services for all community based services. Um, but beyond that, I've been in any of the COVID funding pots and some of the funding from MOJ for next year. What I've tried to argue really consistently is for some ring fenced funding for buy and for services so that we don't lose um, within areas where you might have quite large, you know, larger providers that you wouldn't lose and not understand the importance of, of smaller charities and the mix um, and the need for consortiums to be commissioned so that you have a really healthy um, provision of services that are trusted, trusted um, and known to communities. And so um, I try to do that through, you know, holding government to account on who they're funding, um, trying to advise before funding even is coming out. So um, some of the MOJ, for example, some of the funding announced in the last couple of weeks from the Ministry of Justice um, includes a capacity building fund mm -hmm. for buying for services. Um, and, you know, the biggest way I think we could address this would be to have government commit to expanding the statutory duty for for from just refuge or accommodation based services to all community based services. And I know that is a big ask, but you know, as I was arguing just last week to, um, you know, to the prime minister's office, we keep we, we are constantly held back by the fact that community based services are constantly trying to chop and change funding in order to survive. And then we never get to earlier intervention, prevention, you know, more ambitious ways that we could work together. And so we've really got to bottom out and just settle down um, some of the insecurities of funding. I One of the other things I would say is, I just have to say this because it's a bill related thing. It's something that all, all 58 people on the, the call could do something about this week is to get in touch, um, you know, get in touch with MPs or any decision makers in Parliament that you know or have connections with, because these are this is, that is still very much a live debate with the domestic abuse bill and also um, the inclusion of migrant women in services for migrant women um, and extension of the DDVC. Some of the some of the um, ways that we can fund services for migrant women and a firewall. Um, so that if people come to services, they would never fear information being passed along about them to immigration um, officials. So these are the, some of the key amendments that I I try to um, to work for. I know that's that's probably that's the kind of the here and the now of what's going on. But I hope next link you get a sense of how committed I am. Um, I'm absolutely committed to you know buy and for services making making a really strong case at the at any level um but it's certainly any of the forums i'm i have access to and we're we're commissioning out a couple of ex a couple of projects specifically right now um to really help build some of the policy um work that's needed or information that's needed for migrant women specifically thank you nicole and, and that that ring fence but also the sustainability we can't continue to lurch from one year to another, um, sort of jumping to whoever's pulling the strings for funding. And, and all that's happening is that, you know, what we're trying to do is, is make sustainable change in our, in our communities. And, and if we don't, if, if, we, if we always judge ourselves with what we've done in the last year, that early intervention, which is absolutely key, we will never, we will, we will never crack it if we yeah. don't have sustainable funding. OK, thank you. I'm going to have to move on because I do have lots of other questions, but we could spend probably the next hour on on that one. So the next one comes from a local provider voices and it's about partnership working and best practice. So how can domestic abuse partnerships be supported to develop coordinated de delivery of domestic abuse services and ones that we can co-create? I think that's probably the, the, the mm -hmm. key, key question. I think I, I think I've talked to voices as well. I hope I'm remembering the right conversation, but it's great to see 
um, to to hear them on this call and, and hear the question. I mean, I'm a huge believer, and I use this term coordinated community response because that, you know, the most recent organization I came from is called Standing Together. That's how I know Anna Smith. She was running our sister organization, which was the Frontline um, Domestic Abuse and kind of Criminal Justice Service. And um, and she was running it very well, by the way. She's amazing. Um, but Standing Together was created by a group of founders who, who worked in various organizations, the local authority, the CPS, the police, the local, you know, the local law center, the women's sector. Um, and they came together and they created Standing Together to, to really hold them all to account for kind of systemic change. And so I feel like I learned a lot from having, I worked there twice, once when I first moved here and once at the, before I was, um, before I was uh, appointed as commissioner. And the root of that is really thinking about um, how do you create that kind of operational and strategic partnership? And one of the things that um, we've really tried to do since I've, I've started to bring on staff is create those, those geographic leads um, and also create a mailing list of all of the people who are involved with or running or coordinating these strategic partnerships. Because what is so interesting about that is, you know, in one area, it will be sitting at the, the PCC will be hosting kind of the primary kind of strategic partnership in, in, a re, in an area. And then in another area, it might be an executive board of the safeguarding partnership and who will run the kind of the DA strategic group and in a lot of commissioning and decisions will come from that and then in other areas it will be the community safety partnership so i don't know if it's about shifting and kind of requiring that partnership to have to sit any one of those places but it's about identifying at least for me at the first step where are those discussions taking place you know, how much or do they have um, the right information and the right kind of um, attention, really? Because I think what we miss a lot at the national level is the kind of key information from those partnerships. So one roundabout way to answer your question from Voices is mm -hmm. I really believe in investing in thinking about how do we coordinate these really important partnerships and that have the voice of the survivor at the center and have the service providers who are experiencing through their service users how all of the the statutory and community-based services are doing um, how do we have their voices at the center and feeling quite equal because a lot of times those service providers they 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 could become a bit disconnected because they're commissioned by those partnerships mm -hmm. um, and so the the equality of voice and the repre representation is not there so I think we have to balance that back make sure that they can really influence um, and and then I think you're on to the ability to problem solve and share information and be you know, really proactive about that co-creation of, you know, what does it really take? So the area where I worked at Standing Together over years and years created specialist courts, they created operational groups for health, for housing, um, for, um, you know, a whole range of practice, really, children, um, children's services. So it create it, it gave kind of a structure for that really active partnership working and so one of the things i keep reminding government is you can't just throw out commissioning guidance and statutory guidance um, and not be sure you know who receives that guidance and who at the local level is kind of making sure that these conversations and this coordination happens it's not just about training it's not just about guidance it's about creating the structures for people to work together and so I really want to um, really help those kind of strategic and operational conversations and structures, because I, I really do believe that's where you unlock so much progress. Yeah, well, I think that we, 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 we would all agree with that. And that uh, active partnership working, uh, you have many active partners around this table and we would all, you know, be delighted to be working uh, as closely with at, at a local, at a local regional and a national and a national level. 
So the, th the third question we have is, um, well, it was an observation from uh, BSW CCG. Um, so in, in light of recognition of children as victims in the DA bill, which you've mentioned, we would welcome planning and funding for relationship based work, not consultancy led, starting at a very young age, for example, parenting and relationship support from pregnancy onwards, universally in integrated and accessible. So how can you as the commissioners assist in lobbying for equitable access to early prevention methods for all from a very young age, as well as for children and families? It's a really good question. I mean, I think of all the, um, you know, I was talking earlier about the mapping that we're doing and we're, we're starting, we've just done kind of some initial mapping in four areas to just get a bit of a method together about the, the national mapping we'll do in coming months. And we're also doing the same for perpetrator services, but I think services in relation to children um, really you know, there's a level, there's a level of complication in my mind about about understanding that because in some areas there is so, there's so much difference in terms of what children's social care offer in terms of early help, some of their internal um, or de internally developed kind of safeguarding and early intervention system. So that differs from area to area. And there's some really interesting initiatives, some family safeguarding initiatives that, re that, that actually have three people kind of working with the family. So someone who's working with the adult kind of survivor of domestic abuse, the child obviously, um, and also the, the person, you know, the perpetrator or the parent who's using violence. Um, and, you know, that's not something I've seen traditionally in a lot of the areas that I've worked, that level of kind of, um, that level of work. And so I guess what I mean is there's a lot of differences within children's social care. And then there's many, many differences, again, between what then is commissioned out to the, the charitable, you know, the third sector in terms of children and also just what good looks like. So mm -hmm. some of some of what I've been trying to do is reach out to as many of those partnerships as possible and also look at um, really try to influence some of the people who are doing kind of what works in children's social care to focus on kind of these these practice um, differences, because I really do think that is you know, very underdeveloped. So I'd love to hear, again, you know, the kinds of amazing practices you will know about from your area. But I would also be interested if people had thoughts about that, because I do think that's that is a struggle to kind of figure out. It's it's a little bit, I guess, putting it this way, it's a little bit easier for me to think, well, what does good look like in terms of a provision for adult survivors? Um, what should that what's the breadth of that provision what ought that look like and for people who want to change um, and then when you get to children i think i'm a little less sure that we're really confident and clear what good looks like within children's social care what good looks like within the rest of the kind of services that really ought to be in place for children and i think we have a lot of work to do to really get um, to get clearer on that. But if anyone out there has um, has some ideas about that, I can see, I'll try to read the chat really carefully later too, but, um, but I would definitely be interested. Um, and it's something that will, you know, when I was saying we have policy leads and research leads within the office, they will all, will be looking to um, all of those, particularly the policy leads having particular areas of work that they focus on and children would certainly be one of them and i've been trying to there's a new children's commissioner who's just um who will just be starting soon and i'll be really keen to try to work as as best i can with the children's commissioner in england and and in wales yeah and uh, certainly and listening to to the voice of the child as well will always be key obviously and in the chat bar from kate was very much about the uh, from the youth from the youth parliament that domestic abuse was the second highest concern which was raised. So I think that that's uh, that, that's, that's really key. Thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we move on to a question. It's a two part question from Reprovide, which is a, a perpetrator program active in Avon and Somerset. 
So the government is committed to the inclusion of a perpetrator approach within their wider domestic abuse strategy in line with the DA bill. So firstly, how important do you think that perpetrator interventions are when attempting to tackling DA? And secondly, what would you like to see included within a perpetrator strategy? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I'm aware of Reprovide as well, and um, and I, I know that they're doing some important work and evaluation in this area. And um, I mean, it's incredibly important. And I do think, you know, reflecting on the last few years, I feel like the kind of the tide has turned in terms of um, the ambition within our conversations about this. To, I think for years and years, we were so worried that if we were to prioritize kind of intervention with perpetrators, somehow that would be taking funding away from services for victims. And I think now we the, the appetite and the kind of ambition is raised and we realize that we have to, you know, equally argue for all for both of those things and, and quite a few other things as well that this is a huge issue it's so highly prevalent we have to invest more and just simply the pie uh, you know has to be bigger in terms of where we look to um in terms of funding and initiatives and so i think the government is very i mean i don't speak for the government but my my feeling is that they're very much on board they did try in this year to um, commission out some services in relation and some evaluation and research in relation to perpetrators. They commissioned it very, very late in the year, um, you know, obviously to some extent because of COVID. Um, but there were some missed opportunities this year, but I think that at the very least it shows kind of the, the interest and I think there's every intention to continue, you know, a level of work and focus of work into the next years and i would i would definitely agree with that and um and i think that the reason why i like the the strategy or the call to action in terms of a strategy is that it it talks about the range of you know what is early you know prevention early intervention um and it's not just focused on crisis intervention with perpetrators because i do believe we've got to look at some of there's some really great areas of practice and again, I, I think the role that I would like to try to play the most is try to really highlight kind of where we have good practices and where we're kind of have good evaluation in terms of where things are working and try to highlight that and make that much more common practice and really push government to really have that ambition.